Day 71 on the Florida Trail begins with some more bike riding. This is called Miami Canal Road. And it's very pretty, I must say. This is what I'm having to go through now. It's very hard going and so windy. I'm gonna call it a day at 20 miles today. I had some troubles. My chain came off my bicycle so I had to push it for quite a ways in tall weeds and stuff and then a kind Mexican guy put it back on for me. But I was in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so that took some time. And then I'm just tired. So I'll see you tomorrow. Day 72 begins with some more bike riding and it's a much calmer day today. So I'm very happy about that. Well, what have we here? Notice to southbound hikers, that would be me. The Florida Trail has been temporarily rerouted due to construction. Okay. Oh, there's my white blazes. Go this way. Nice. <laughs> Some cranky birds out there this morning. It's a beautiful day today compared to yesterday. Ooh. Well, there's the part under construction where I should be on, I guess, but wow, I am very much enjoying my side. This detour is fabulous. I could keep the camera rolling all the time with all the birds out there. I am now on the Seminole Indian Reservation and this is beautiful. I love this. Just such a perfect day. Good cloud coverage, not too windy, beautiful scenery, lots of birds. Oh, I am enjoying this. We got some cows. Oh, fun. Junior Cypress Rodeo Arena Entertainment Center. Oh, and then we got some ponies here. And some cows. Fun. All kinds of fun. Oh, little pony. You're pretty cute. Oh, this is cool. I love those thatched roots. Big Cypress Landing Convenience Store. This is where you could eat your ice cream cone if you wanted to. So many neat things to do on this reservation. Billy Swamp Safari. 
or down that way. 27.4 miles on my bike today and that's it for biking for the rest of the Florida Trail. From now on out it's pretty much swamp stomping. Day 73 on the Florida Trail. It feels good to get back on my feet. It was good to be able to cover long distances on the bike, but I think I did, I don't know, I didn't add it up, but I think probably around 110 miles on the bicycle. And so my body was not used to that much riding and I developed um, Achilles tendonitis so the last day yesterday was so painful biking. Thankfully I can walk, I can feel it, but I can still walk. Anyway, enough grumbling. I get to walk now and I am so happy. Just big, beautiful green trees. <laughs> and this is February. This is so beautiful. Now I can get back to talking at you guys again too, which I'm happy about. Anyway, during the plagues of Egypt, when the Israelites were in bondage and God wanted to get them out of bondage, after nine plagues, Pharaoh keeps hardening his heart. So the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After this, he will let you go. It doesn't say why, but God had the children of Israel ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. The Egyptians respected the Hebrews by now, and Moses was a great man in their sight. So if they asked for something, the Egyptians gave it. They were probably so happy that the people that had caused them so much misfortune were about to leave that they happily gave of their means. Also, in dealing with debt slavery, at the time of release, the owner of the slave was to provide material goods for the slave. This was instituted in Deuteronomy. So Moses actually does see Pharaoh again face to face, and he didn't die like Pharaoh had threatened. Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, to the firstborn of the female servant, to all the firstborn of the animals. All right, this is the boundary, the gate. So now I am no longer in Seminole country, or at least the reservation part. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, but not among the children of Israel, so that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Then Moses left Pharaoh in great anger. Thus far, Moses had displayed more than human patience with his dealings with the king. This is a reflection of the long-suffering and patience of God, whose ambassador Moses was, and in whose name and by whose authority he had acted. Now, however, the wrath of the departing servant of God was evidence to the hard-hearted king that his day of grace was at an end and that the wrath of God was about to burst upon him. But you know what? Pharaoh still didn't get it. Even with that promise that his firstborn was going to die at a specified time, and even with the promises and forthcomings of all the previous plagues, which showed that God meant business, Pharaoh would still not let the Hebrews go. So God spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt and said, this month shall be the beginning of months to you. It shall be the first month of the year to you. I just want to point out that it was God who spoke to Moses. 
Moses was not the originator of the laws in the Pentateuch that bear his name. We must remember that everything comes from God. Most of the laws that God gives Moses to pass on to the children of Israel were given at Mount Sinai, but Moses wants to make it clear that this first ordinance, called the Passover, was started in Egypt. The Passover celebration marks day one of the Israelite religious calendar and corresponds to March and April. The civil Israelite calendar began in the month of Tishri, roughly September, October. God told Moses and Aaron to tell the children of Israel, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take a lamb for his household. And if his household is too small, then he may share it with his neighbor. The lamb needs to be a male of the first year and without blemish. And it can actually be taken from the sheep or the goats. Then on the 14th day of the same month, the whole congregation of Israel shall kill this lamb at twilight. Twilight is the moment marking the beginning of a new day in biblical tradition. And for this particular night, it marked the beginning of a new era for the Israelites. I know I've been talking at you quite a bit, but this is all there is to show you. Just a road in the woods, so I might as well talk. After killing it, they were to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the basin that had the blood and then strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood. And no one was to go out the door of his house until the morning. Then they were to eat the flesh on that night. It was not to be eaten raw or boiled, but it was to be roasted whole on the fire with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. None of it was to be left for another meal. Whatever was left was to be burned. And God said, you shall eat it with a belt around your waist, sandals on your feet, and a staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. Because the Lord was going to pass over the land of Egypt that night and strike all the firstborn of man and beast. Okay, this is a nice little feature. A mini swamp. Oh, and another mini swamp on the other side with trash in it. Both man and beast, because the Egyptians worshipped different animals as gods. And so the Lord God wanted to show that he was God and that he was the one executing the judgment. Okay, what's this sign all about? Oh, you got a campsite that way. Blue Trail, I don't want to go that way because I came that way. 4.8 to I-75, that's where I'm going today. Oh, that's easy. This is sweet. When God passed over the houses and sees the blood applied as directed, he will spare the inhabitants of that house from the last plague. However, when he sees that there is no blood, he will kill the firstborn of the household. Then God said that this day would be a memorial and they were to keep it as a feast to God throughout all their generations. The Lord goes on to say that seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And if anyone eats leavened bread, they shall be cut off from Israel. It was to be called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And on the first day, there was to be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there was to be a holy convocation. Unleavened bread was travel food in those days and would become the food of the Exodus. Establishing the importance of eating unleavened bread in later celebrations reminded the Israelites of the dramatic events of the Exodus. To be cut off if one ate leavened bread may sound drastic, but God more than once in the Bible promises that people will be cut off from his covenant with them and his community, thus suggesting eternal results. Most of the transgressions resulting in this drastic state involve the conscious disobedience of divine law. It's not clear whether this cutting off was actually being killed or if it was a disfellowshipping. But if there was outright disobedience, it's obviously that they didn't want to be on God's side. When Satan rebelled in heaven and went against God, he had to be cut off and cast out of heaven 
just to preserve the peace and harmony in heaven. Same with the camp of Israel. It was meant to preserve the peace and unity of the camp. So Moses told all Israel what they were to do on Passover night, and the people bowed their heads and worshiped God, and they did what was commanded of them. If we did what God asks of us to do in a worshipful attitude, what a blessing we would receive. The divine passing over is not based on human efforts, but rather God's divine protection and grace. Oh, there's a red trail and a blue trail and a yellow trail. What's that all about? Anyway, 2.5 miles to the highway. I'm making good progress. Yep, that is a gigantuous crocodilian. And I've been walking by water and have seen quite a bit of them. Oh, there's another one. Well, this is opening up into some kind of different surroundings. That's pretty cool. I come across these guys every so often. What exactly are they? Little crickets or grasshoppers? These are absolutely beautiful. If anyone knows what they are, let me know. We have some friends in Fort Lauderdale, which is under an hour away from here. So we're gonna go there. I can't even tell you when the last time I had a shower was. And they're gonna let us do laundry and I need to make some more granola. So, oh, I'm excited, what a blessing. And then I'll be ending out the trail soon. I'm very happy about that. Another sleeping beauty. That's a nice path to the water's edge, but honestly, I am too chicken. They could jump out of the water and totally get you. All right, I got a gate situation. So in hindsight, I totally could have biked this trail today. <laughs> Bummer. Oh well, at least I got a good talk in with you guys. Painting blood on the doorposts required faith in God's divine protection. When you exhibit faith, God does the rest. I've done 8.4 miles today and this is where I will head the next day. And there is my freeway to take me to Fort Lauderdale.